Well, greetings everyone. Uh, my name is Rod Quillitz. I'm a clinical pharmacy coordinator for infectious disease and antimicrobial stewardship at H. Lee Moffitt Cancer Center at, in Tampa, Florida. And my topic today will be antifungal prophylaxis in the cancer patient. Uh, first, I kind of want to start about why we should or shouldn't give antifungal prophylaxis to these patients. We should in order to prevent mucocutaneous infections like oral, esophageal, or vaginal candidiasis which, as you can see in, these, in this slide, can be, you know, range from, from very irritating to the patient to, to, ex to extremely damaging to the GI tract uh, or GU tract. Um, we also want to uh, prevent candidemia and invasive candidiasis, um, more importantly, right? With, especially when we consider that with a high-risk patient population, for example, the hemat the uh, our stem cell transplant patients, we have about a 24% attributable mortality with candidemia and invasive candidiasis. We also want to prevent invasive aspergillosis in patients with prolonged neutropenia and or lymphopenia, which has about a 40% uh, attributable mortality in this patient population. And I've included some um, lovely slides there, in, including on the, on the far left, our, our as pulmonary aspergillosis with the halo sign in the middle are our uh, pulmonary aspergillosis with the crescent sign, which you do not see during neutropenia because it's because it's neutrophils uh, uh, cause, attacking, causing necrosis. That gives us a lovely picture. And then a really sad case on the far right where we had a CNS aspergillosis. But certainly not every cancer patient needs antifungal prophylaxis. So, the, so you know, what are some of the downsides to antifungal prophylaxis? Well, toxicity, of course. Anytime you're adding a prophylactic drug, you have to think about toxicity. So we have to consider hepatotoxicity is a real issue. Not only are these patients potentially on hepatotoxic chemotherapy regimens, but we're adding additional potentially hepatotoxic regimens when we give them azole, azole antifungals, the lipid formulation of amphotericin B, or a kind of candens. Certainly, um, if we want to use amphotericin B prophylactically, we have to we have to deal with the fact that these patients are at risk for nephrotoxicity, electrolyte wasting, and infusion reactions. Um, I think we're all much more aware than we had been in the past of the potential issues with QTC prolongation and the risk for torsades. Certainly, for certainly the azole antifungals can cause QTC prolongation. And uh, amphotericin B, while it doesn't directly cause QTC prolongation, it can cause hypokalemia uh, or hypomagnesemia which causes QTC prolongation. Uh, patients can have visual or CNS side effects, predominantly with voriconazole. You can see um, dermatological side effects, particularly with the azole antifungals. Voriconazole adds in the element of photosensitivity. And there are a lot of potential drug interactions with the pa either with the patient's chemotherapeutic agents, um, which they need for their treatment, or with other um, maintenance medications the patients may have. But just looking at the chemotherapeutic agents, for example, there are a lot of potential drug interactions here of clinically relevant chemo agents. Vin vinc alkaloids, busulfan, cyclophosphamide, iphosphamide, taxanes, etoposide, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. The uh, extended spectrum azoles like voriconazole and posiconazole have a significant effect on their metabolism by inhibiting cytochrome P450 3A4. And for most of these, um, the, uh, the issue is that you may see increased toxicity from the drug. But when you start um, dealing with a uh, drug like phosphamide, you may see reduced bioactivation and reduced efficacy. And cyclophosphamide is such a complicated uh, metabolic series of pathways that uh, it's, it's a little bit of a guessing game is exactly the, the, uh, the final outcome there. But in any case, um, our, our uh, Hematologists, oncologist colleagues generally don't like us mucking around with their chemotherapy drugs. <clears throat> okay, obviously, anytime we start giving um, a drug more frequently, antimicrobial more frequently, we have to worry about the microorganisms developing resistance. And of course, there's substantial economic um, toxicity as well. So just making sure we have all our definitions together, right? And, um, using IDSA's guidelines, neutropenia is defined as an ANC of less than 500. 
or an ANC that's expected to decrease to less than 500 during the next 48 hours, generally post-chemotherapy. Profound or severe neutropenia is an ANC less than 100, and you'll hear the term functional neutropenia tossed around. <coughs> it's referring to patients whose hematological malignancy results in qualitative defects, so impaired phagocytosis and killing of pathogens, for example, of the circulating neutrophils. So there's a lot of debate about if you have a patient who has, for example, um, acute um, leukemia and they're loaded with blasts, and they, but they still are not neutropenic, um, but how functional are their neutrophils? Are, you know, is, is, is an ANC of 1,000 in that patient uh, equal to a patient ANC of a thousand in a patient without those issues. Okay, so when should, per the IDSA guidelines, which patients should not get antifungal prophylaxis? Well, certainly it's not indicated for patients who are anticipated to have a duration of neutropenia of less than seven days. When when is it indicated for pr prophylaxis against candida infections? So. Patients who have a substantial risk of invasive candidal infections, such as our allogeneic stem cell transplant recipients, or our acute leukemic patients who are receiving intensive remission induction or salvage uh, induction chemotherapy. And the threshold uh, incidence of candidate infections, at which point fluconazole prophylaxis is, is uh, considered advisable, is when we reach about the 6 to 10%. So, in terms of prophylaxis against aspergillus, the, uh, I want to point out that uh, in pre-engraftment allogeneic stem cell transplant patients or autologous stem cell transplant patients, <laughs> prophylaxis against aspergillus is not generally recommended. However, a mold active agent is recommended for prophylaxis in patients with a history of invasive aspergillosis who's going to have a substantial period of neutropenia or a patient who is anticipated to have a prolonged duration of neutropenia of at least two weeks. Or a patient who is already neutropenic coming into their stem cell transplant. <clears throat> okay. Another patient population that, that warrants um, anti-mold prophylaxis is the allogeneic stem cell transplant patient. Um, not necessarily this says greater than or equal to 13 years of age because this is, you know, pulled from the clinical trial that posaconazole conducted, but, but, the, but pediatric patients also warrant, um, pediatric patients also warrant uh, antimal prophylaxis uh, if they have acute or chronic extensive graft host disease who have, and they're being treated with an intensive immunosuppressive regimen such as high-dose corticosteroids or antithrombocyte globulin or an, a steroid sparing regimen consisting of a combination of greater than equal to two immunosuppressive agents or mortalities. Which all kind of comes back to this little chart here. The relative risk for invasive fungal infections is going to be dependent on the duration of your neutropenia and the severity of your lymphopenia. Okay, so what, what are our antifungal options to prophylax those patients who warrant prophylaxis? So the azoles tend to be the workhorses here. Um, we, we have data with fluconazole, atriconazole, posaconazole, and voriconazole. Um, the echinocandins have been used for this indication as well. Um, we have more data with mica fungin than with caspofungin or anigula fungin, which is why I'm going to focus on mica fungin uh, during this talk. And amphotericin B formulations, either conventional amphotericin B or liposol formulations of amphotericin B have also been used in a prophylactic manner. So we're going to try to hit on some of the available data for these various options. But before we do, I think it's always useful when we talk about it, we're predominantly, you know, our, our, while there are a variety of, of organisms that can cause invasive fungal infections, the highest risk ones that we tend to think about when we design an antifungal prophylaxis strategy is candida and aspergillus, right? Um, and so I think it's important for us to know which, which, uh, which agents that we're considering for prophylaxis have activity against which bugs. Right? So for, the, for Canada species, you know, looking at Canada albicans, Canada kefir, Dublinensis, Tropicalis, 
you know, this, these these bugs, while they can while they can cause severe clinical disease, they do tend to be susceptible to fluconazole, itra, voriconazole, posconazole, kind of candens, and amphotericin. Canada galbrata tends to be more problematic, right? Because it likes to it likes to create efflux pumps that can potentially efflux out the azoles. So you can have a fluconazole susceptible or susceptible dose dependent um, or a frankly resistant um, Canada galbrata isolate depending on the efflux pumps. Um, this can, you can have cross um, resistance with other azoles as well. So acceptability testing becomes really critical here. Echinocannons um, and amphotericin have retained their activity, except now we're starting to see case reports of a kind of cannon resistant Canada galbrata, which is pretty scary, right? So we're well, that's definitely a trend we're going to have to monitor. Canada cruzii is intrinsically resistant to fluconazole; it's just not able to bind the target enzyme. However, um, Canada cruzii usually maintains its susceptibility to the extended spectrum azoles, as well as the kind of candens and amphotericin B. Canada parapsilosis and Garamunde are uh, very azole susceptible, amphotericin susceptible, but they do tend to run a little bit higher MICs against the kind of candens. So when you it's not when you see a breakthrough um, candida infection on the kind of candens, traditionally that has been more likely to be a parapsilosis or Garamunde. And Canada lusitania is listed there because it's the one candida species that I'm aware of that um, is intrinsically resistant to amphotericin. Switching over to Aspergillus, we have the, the bugs that we tend to think about the most. The most common, certainly, are Fumigatus and Flavus. Um, you know, so you get your classic amphotericin um, susceptibility profile with activity of the extended spectrum azoles. Um, which have the potential to be cytal against aspergillus, a kind of candens which are static against aspergillus, and of course amphotericin, which, which is cytal against aspergillus, with the exception of aspergillus terius, um, which is intrinsically resistant to amphotericin, and used to have the highest mortality rate associated with it before, the, before voriconazole became available. Now, the, now when you use voriconazole to treat terius, the outcomes are very similar to other aspergillus. Also, I want to point out we've seen aspergillus ustus infections in allogeneic stem cell transplant patients despite voriconazole or caspofungin prophylaxis, and the treatment of choice would be a lipid formulation of amphotericin B. And then some of our less common, um, less common uh, molds, uh, you know, Fusarium, where depending on which species or some species we're talking about, amphotericin, um, usually lipid formulations are going to be your most active drugs, and voriconazole may also be very valuable as well. Um, Cetosporum apospermum, where the extended spectrum azoles are your best choices. Cetosporum proliferans, which you pray your patient doesn't get because we don't have any great antifungal agents against this particular um, fungus, and, and while we use combination therapy, um, when that does arise, um, we mostly have to pray for neutrophil count recovery. And the dematiaceous molds, which are also ext extended spectrum azole susceptible. Okay, so starting with the azole antifungals, I like this slide because you can see that the structural similarities between fluconazole and voriconazole. Voriconazole is actually, Pfizer actually utilized fluconazole um, to, and chemically altered fluconazole to create voriconazole. Um, also, itraconazole and posaconazole, you know, they have markedly different structures compared to fluconazole and voriconazole. Okay, so fluconazole is mainly active against candida, uh, has some activity against cryptococcus as well, reduced activity against candida galbrata and candida cruzea is not susceptible as we discussed before. Dose-dependent activity, you can treat mucocutaneous infections with 100 to 200 milligrams per day, systemic and Infections you're going to treat with 400 to 800 milligrams per day, occasionally even higher for an obese patient with a sensitive dose-dependent Canada galbrata. Um, excellent bioavailability. It's a mild CYP3A4 inhibitor. Um, as you push the dose, though, you're going to see more uh, 3A4 inhibition, and you're going to start to see some 2C9 inhibition as well. 
and we do dose adjust for conazole for renal dysfunction. The classic study um, that's quoted for fluconazole prophylaxis uh, in the stem cell transplant patient is this one from uh, Dr. Marr and colleagues. Um, this particular version was published back in 2000, um, and they looked at 134 allo BMT patients. Uh, got fluconazole versus 131, we received placebo, and a small number of autologous transplant patients uh, received fluconazole or placebo. And, and what they were able to show was a mortality advantage that was statistically significant and prolonged with fluconazole prophylaxis. And this was a 400 milligrams per day, starting at the beginning of conditioning therapy and, and lasting till at least day plus 50. Um, one thing to be aware of, part, part of this is explained by preventing, preventing uh, candidemia, candidiasis. Part of it may be explained by a drug interaction between fluconazole and cyclophosphamide, which shunts the meta metabolic pathways towards less toxic metabolites. So these patients actually had less toxicity from their conditioning chemotherapy, and that might have been part of the reason that we see it. Looking at uh, patients who are at a lower uh, risk for infectious complications uh, than the stem cell transplant patients, um, fluconazole prophylaxis, um, Rotsine back in 1999 compared to fluconazole 400 a day for placebo for acute leukemia or auto stem cell transplant patients. It uh, reduced superficial fungal infections, dropped, dropped it down from 18% to 7%, and it reduced definitive and probable invasive fungal infections. And they, and they saw fewer deaths from invasive fungal infections, predominantly in the acute leukemic patient population. And uh, also we have this meta-analysis uh, uh, from Kenda in 2000, 16 fluconazole prophylaxis trials with over 3,000 patients, um, reduced superficial fungal infections, even at doses of 50 to 200 milligrams a day, but it was not effective at reducing definitive invasive fungal infection incidence, except in trials where the incidence of invasive fungal infection was greater than 15%. Right, so you, again, you had to kind of pick, pick your more immunocompromised patients who would benefit. Okay, itraconazole or Sporinox. Now, we're not using as much of this as we used to, but there is some data and we should be aware of it. Um, so it's available as an oral capsule with somewhat erratic bioavailability since 1992. And then in 1997, they came out with a oral solution that was solubilized with uh, hydroxypropyl beta cyclodextrin. And we briefly had an IV formulation of itraconazole, which was also uh, cyclodextrin solubilized. But the IV formulation is off the market, not because the uh, drug, um, not because of toxicity issues, but because the drug just wasn't selling, frankly. Voriconazole came out about the same time and ate its lunch. Um, Itraconazole is hepatically eliminated. Um, the capsule should be taken with food for 63% higher AUC. Oral solution, on the other hand, should be taken on an empty stomach for 31% higher AUC. The bottom line, though, is that the itraconazole oral solution provides superior concentrations to the uh, capsules when they're both taking optimally. I just, when I talk about itraconazole, I do want to mention that it's contraindicated in patients with congestive heart failure. There have been uh, 58 cases of CHF reported to the FDA, 28 hospitalizations, 13 deaths, which has not been reported with the other azole antifungals. Um, other toxicities of itraconazole are pretty standard for the, for the, for the azole uh, patient population, but there is a lot of GI complaints with itraconazole. A lot of patients find the oral solution unpalatable, which can lead to noncompliance. Of course, you have to monitor patients for hepatotoxicity or QTC prolongation or cutaneous side effects. So Dr. Marr and colleagues were interested in looking at allogeneic stem cell transplant patients. They had given fluconazole prophylaxis with very positive results, and they wanted to see if we can give itraconazole, a drug that has anti-aspergillus activity as well as candida activity. Um, so they studied 304 patients randomized to get itraconazole or fluconazole, um, and they had a uh, they had a 36% incidence of 
a 36% incidence of discontinuation with a draconazole versus 16% for fluconazole, mostly because of GI complaints, 24 versus 5%. And there was no significant difference, and that's 2.5 mg per kilogram of itraconazole, um, not 2.5 milligrams. That would be obviously very sub subtherapeutic. Um, there was no difference in overall or fungal-free survival. Um, there was a trend towards fewer IFIs during therapy if, for those patients who could tolerate itraconazole. Um, fewer invasive mold infections, 12% versus 5%, with a similar instance of candidiasis. Um, also, if you look at some data from uh, Bardakis in 2005, a meta-analysis of five randomized trials of fluconazole versus itraconazole prophylaxis in neutropenic chemoc patients. Fluconazole had fewer adverse drug reactions, but fluconazole had more suspected and documented invasive fungal infections. But most importantly, there was no statistically significant differences in documented uh, IFI overall mortality or mortality attributable to IFI. So, Itraconazole just wasn't giving us enough of a antifungal bang for our buck in order to put up with the G increased GI complaints of our patients. Okay. On the other hand, we talk about the the newer extended spectrum azoles, beginning with posiconazole, which is FDA approved for prophylaxis of, of invasive aspergillosis and candidiasis in high risk patients. Specifically, our MDS AML patients, status post induction, and allos stem cell transplant patients with GVHD. Right. The oral suspension is approved at a dose of 200 milligrams or 5 mLs three times a day with meals. The delayed release tablets are now available since, since December of uh, 2013. And the dose is 300 milligrams, which is 300 milligram delayed release tablets twice a day on day one, followed by 300 milligrams daily thereafter. And we have an IV formulation with the same dosing, 300 milligrams in 150 mLs of D5W or normal saline, infused over 90 minutes intravenously via central venous catheter, twice a day on day one, and then daily thereafter. Package insert does mention that we can administer one dose via peripheral IV um, while we're awaiting placement of central venous catheter. Um, they recommend a 30-minute infusion when administering it via peripheral vein, but they did study it, it and they found that uh, thrombophlebitis is a real issue with multiple doses of IV posiconazole. 60% of patients in one, in one study um, developed thrombophlebitis, so they don't recommend more than one dose of uh, posiconazole peripherally. Posiconazole can also be used for oral pharyngeal candidiasis, including fluconazole, itraconazole, or refractory cases. Okay, when we're, some things to be aware of when we use posiconazole prophylactically, particularly when we're talking about the liquid. So it's dependent on, the liquid is dependent on gastric pH for absorption. So you can see adding ginger ale increases your area under the curve. Adding a proton pump inhibitor drops your area under the curve. Um, and posiconazole has saturable absorption. So... <clears throat> So you're, actu you're actually able to get higher concentrations if you, say, give 200 milligrams four times a day as opposed to 400 milligrams twice a day, assuming your patient will comply with that regimen. Um, and we also see that, that it's really critical that this drug be taken with food or an enteral supplement for optimal absorption. Posiconazole is primary, primarily metabolized by UDP glucuronidation. It has no major oxidative SIP-mediated metabolites. Uh, package insert says that PK data not sufficient to determine if dose reduction is required for hepatic dysfunction, but when you look at the curves, you'll see that there's minimum, minimal difference, and perhaps patients with uh, some hepatic dysfunction may actually get slightly better, uh, you know, exposure to posiconazole, um, so we wouldn't dose adjust posiconazole if you elect to use it in a patient with um, liver dysfunction. It does inhibit saccharin P453A4, but only 3A4. It's excellent distribution. We have some data uh, about its utilization for CNS infections uh, in HIV patients. So there's, some of it's getting through to the CNS. The half-life's about 37.2 hours for the suspension. Um, and 
with the tablets, it was about 31 hours for the, for volunteers, which is about 25 hours for <coughs> sorry, uh, about 31 hours um, for the tablets and volunteers, and about 25 hours um, for IV and volunteers as well. Posaconazole therapeutic drug monitoring is generally not recommended, although in this study, uh, using it as an agent for salvage therapy for invasive aspergillosis, the patients who had extremely low concentrations of uh, posaconazole did have, a, did have the worst outcome, and those who had the highest concentrations had the best. But now we have the posaconazole solid uh, oral tablets, or the delayed release tablets, and they are de designed to release the entire dose of solubilized posaconazole in the small intestine as opposed to the absorption that's happening at the level of the stomach with the liquid. This maximizes oral absorption and it's independent of gastric food and gastric pH. It's also independent of, so we don't have the PPI drug interaction either. Um, and with the, with the currently FDA approved dose of 300 milligrams twice a day times two, then 300 daily, the average um, average concentration that steady state is about 1,460 which is substantially better than you're able to, to reliably get with the liquid. And 97% of patients are, th are within the goal range of 500 to 2,500 nanograms per ml. Posaconazole IV has been soluble with a sulfobutyl sulfo ether beta-cyclodextrin, which is also used for IV voriconazole. Um, has a warning to avoid in patients with cranial clearance less than 50 unless the benefit outweighs the risk. Um, this is, this comes up as well with IV voriconazole, and frankly, the data that we have doesn't support that there's increased toxicity in patients with reduced uh, renal function. Um, and we see again excellent um, steady state concentration of 1430. 95% um, of our patients within our within our goal range with the IV posaconazole. Okay, and this is the actual data. Um, in the AML and MDS induction chemotherapy patients for prophylaxis. They had multi-center trial, 304 patients randomized to posaconazole, 298 randomized to fluconazole or itraconazole. Centers got to choose whether they were a fluke or, or itracenter. Uh, and what they saw is the posaconazole group had lower aspergillosis rates, lower invasive fungal infection rates, and a 33% relative reduction in overall mortality through day 100 in the posaconazole group. They did have a statistically significant difference in terms of uh, mortality compared to fluke itra. In the allogeneic stem cell transplant recipient with GVHD trial, they had a similar number of patients, 301 posaconazole, 299 fluke. Their primary endpoint was reduction of IFI through day 112 uh, study period and they did not meet this, they, it was, they did not achieve a statistically significant uh, difference, as you can see, in the fixed time period, although um, they did have a statistically significant difference in a secondary endpoint of while on prophylaxis. Um, when you look at the posaconazole, the aspergillosis rate, um, they had a lower aspergillosis rate, so you can see, 7 versus 2% or 6 versus 1%, depending whether you're talking fixed time period or while on prophylaxis. What they did not have was a significant overall mortality impact, unlike in the acute leukemic patient population. Although there was a lower mortality from IFI in the posaconazole group, 1% versus 4%, which hit a p-value of 0 0.046. Okay. The other extended spectrum azole uh, that we want to talk about is voriconazole. It's available in 200 milligram, 50 milligram tablets, or an oral suspension, or an IV formulation as well. We always have to let our patients know about potential side effects. Right, the rule of 30: about 30 percent of our patients uh, will experience some visual disturbances. That usually happens about 30 minutes after they get their dose, and lasts for about 30 minutes. And this rarely requires discontinuation of the drug because they tend to be on the mild side. Um, although patients should not drive at night or if they notice any different change in their vision while on voriconazole, this, this is a site of action uh, is the retina and resolves within uh, 14 days after discontinuation based on electroretinography data. 
Uh, voice console is also a photosensitizer. We need to let our patients know about that. Um, we also have to be aware that, that voriconazole can, can cause uh, encephalopathy. Hallucinations or confusion were seen in 13% of the voriconazole group versus 5% of amphotericin B patients in an invasive aspergillosis trial. Admittedly, that's with aggressive dosing, but there is a, a concentration dependent risk for encephalopathy with voriconazole. Excellent bioavailability. Voriconazole, unlike the posiconazole liquid, should be should actually not be taken with food, shouldn't eat for an hour before or after. Its absorption is not affected by pH. <clears throat> it's metabolized predominantly by 2C19, and there's marked genetic polymorphism for 2C19, um, more so than 2C9 or 3A4. There, there is actually a recommendation for dose reducing voriconazole based on child puce scores, and vori inhibits cytochrome P452C19, 2C9, and 3A4. It has a shorter half-life than posiconazole, but it is a concentration-dependent half-life because it's nonlinear pharmacokinetics due to saturable metabolism. Okay, so there's less prophylactic data out there with voriconazole than there is with posiconazole because it's FDA-approved for the treatment of invasive uh, aspergillosis as opposed to prophylaxis. Suppose it did the PROFI studies, or it did where did the treatment studies. Um, this is data from Dr. Wingard and colleagues uh, who looked at 600 standard risk allo stem cell transplant recipients. So this is people who are coming in for their transplant. <coughs> they randomized them to get either fluconazole or voriconazole during their period of neutropenia and up to day plus 100 after transplant or one, plus 180 if the patient had GVHD or uh, a low CD4 count. This was a multi-center randomized double-blinded trial, and they were looking at uh, so the cumulative rates of proven, probable, and presumptive invasive fungal infection: 10.6% <coughs> versus 6.6% at six months, 13.1 versus 11.6% at 12 months. None of these were statistically significant, and their primary endpoint of fungal-free survival, um, there was no difference between the two groups. So this was not felt to be this is part of the reason I said earlier that anti-mold prophylaxis isn't necessary in this patient population. Just the subset that, that develops GVHD and requires high-dose corticosteroids. At six months, there was a, there was a modest um, lead. There were more patients in the fluconazole group than voriconazole group who had aspergillus, but the p-value was just 0.05. But prior to the availability of posiconazole, Voriconazole was um, routinely used for antifungal prophylaxis in our acute leukemic population here at Moffitt. And we continued to use voriconazole for some time in our patients with ALL who were getting vincristine and being discharged so we could you know, you know, hold vincristine, uh, voriconazole for a couple days before and after each vincristine dose to avoid the drug interaction. Uh, and patients who have poor PO intake due to nausea, vomiting, anorexia, and mucositis, we didn't have the posiconazole to leave release tablets until very recently. Now, we actually did a uh, retrospective review of our experience at Moffitt with both agents in the January 2005 to July 2008 uh, time frame, which was presented at ASH in 2008. Um, 195 patients, 129 VORI, 66 posiconazole, similar baseline characteristics, comparable mean days of neutropenia. Um, we saw 7% incidence of proven or probable invasive fungal infection on in our voriconazole patients, 6% on our posiconazole patients. Uh, median time of prophylaxis to diagnosis of invasive fungal infection was very similar. Adverse effects requiring discontinuation were different, but the incidence was quite similar. So at Moffitt, we, you know, we felt and the like the NCCN guidelines also state, you know, would state that either one of the agents is a reasonable option for um, antifungal anti-mold prophylaxis. Although we certainly have to give it to posiconazole that they have, you know, the superior um, level of evidence given the randomized double blank uh, trials they conducted. So, um, what patients cannot get ex extended spectrum azole antifungal prophylaxis? Well, you'll see when you're on in our leukemic ward that uh, we generally try to avoid giving them concurrently with anthracyclines. 
This is a theoretical concern, not a PK drug interaction. The concern is an increased risk of arrhythmias with concurrent administration. In the posaconazole study uh, for prophylaxis, they started the posaconazole 24 hours after the last anthracycline dose was given. For patients, um, I will say that this is a theoretical concern, and if I'm actually treating as opposed to prophylaxing a patient, I will not, I, I won't consider this an absolute contraindication. Um, on the other hand, when the chemotherapy itself is a is a 3A4 substrate um, whose metabolism would be inhibited by posaconazole or voraconazole, um, this is problematic. Right? Vink alkaloids, busulfan, cyclophosphamide, iphosphamide, taxanes, etoposide, um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors like imatinib, satinib, high dose cyclosporin, which is in the less commonly used list regimen. Um, patient already has pre-existing QTC prolongation, we may also be nervous about using it in a patient who already has significant hepatic dysfunction at baseline. And so then we might be thinking about kind of cannons or an amphotericin formulation as a prophylaxis in these patients. This is mycofungin, our second FDA approved kind of cannon, inhibits beta 13 d glucan, the fungal cell wall, cytal against candida, static against aspergillus, um, the drug interactions are manageable. And it is FDA approved for prophylaxis of candida infections in patients undergoing hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Right, so they did a, conducted a randomized double-blind clinical trial, um, 882 patients, 54% of them um, were allogeneic stem cell transplant patients, the rest were autologous. They gave a low dose of mycofungin 50 milligrams Q24 versus fluconazole, 400 milligrams. Um, they started at the beginning of their high-dose chemotherapy and continued until neutrophil recovery. And 80.7% of the patients who received mycofungin met their composite endpoint of successful prophylaxis versus 74% of the patients who received fluconazole. And this, there, this was considered to be a statistically significant difference of the p-value of 0.03. This was their primary endpoint. Um, in terms of breakthrough fungal infections, there were seven in the mycofungin group, 1.6% incidence, aspergillus, candida, fusarium, and zygomycosis. Uh, 11 in the fluconazole group, mostly aspergillus, <coughs> a couple of candida, and two fusarium. And one case of death due to IFI in the mycofungin group, which was zygomycosis. Two cases in the fluconazole group, both due to pulmonary aspergillosis. Okay, we just have a we have uh, an interesting new observational study that was uh, just e-published uh, last month. <clears throat> and this is comparing a kind of cannons versus extended spectrum azoles for antifungal prophylaxis in our acute leukemic patient population. So they looked at, uh, this is a retrospective study, 126 patients with newly diagnosed AML during their first 120 days status post-induction chemotherapy. This was at MD Anderson Cancer Center from 2009 to 2010. <clears throat> These patients had to receive it, uh, re had to have received either an azole, an azole or a kind of candon. Um, they excluded patients who had received multi aspergillus active therapies or only received fluconazole. <coughs> and they wound up with 21 patients with a documented IFI and 104 patients who were IFI free at 120 days. Looking at the kind of Candon prophylaxis patients. They had 38 of these patients. Um, they had uh, they had 14 um, patients with breakthrough invasive fungal infections, and of which six of these were probable aspergillosis, three candidemia, and one each of blastocystomyces, co coccidiomycosis, fusariosis, pyxilomyces, and a sinopulmonary mold infection. Posaconazole or voraconazole prophylaxis, they had 42 with six breakthrough invasive fungal infections that were documented. Probable, probable aspergillosis um, made up four of these and one each of fusariosis and a mold infection with, a, with sterile hyphae. And they did uh, perform a Kaplan Meier curve to show the probability of being invasive fungal infection free over time with voraconazole post-consult prophylaxis or a, can, a kind of canon prophylaxis. There is a caveat about this chart in that uh, they, they didn't 
calculate a p-value because 45 of their patients had changes in their antifungal prophylaxis during this you know 120 day time period so there was a suggestion that there was a higher incidence of of uh, breakthrough invasive breakthrough documented invasive fungal infection with the kind of canon as opposed to this extended spectrum azole antifungal <coughs> And when they did their multivariate analyses for the risk of invasive fungal infection, in fact, they found the echinocannon prophylaxis had a hazard ratio of 4.6 um, with a 95% confidence interval in the 1.8 to about 12 range, p-value of 0 0.002. Um, their only, only other risk for IFI independent variable that came up was clofarabine-based chemotherapy. This is a particularly... Um, myelosuppressive uh, based uh, induction regimen and known to be associated with a higher incidence of IFI um, but there was a similar incidence in terms of azole and anti um, kind of canon treated patients who received clofarabine. Um, there was not a difference though in the incidence of empiric antifungal therapy right so 32 percent of the voriconazole patients and 40 percent of the kind of canon patients wound up um, having a change in their antifungal therapy. And importantly, there was no difference in all cause mortality, 13% versus 10%. So there was a, there's, a, there's a suggestion that the azoles may be more effective at preventing um, anti, uh, um, invasive, invasive fungal infections in these patients, but they did not see a, uh, that this led to a difference in uh, mortality, at least all cause mortality. Okay, another option, um, conventional, conventional or lipid formulations of amphotericin B. So this is amphotericin, it's a polyene antifungal uh, available since the 1950s. Good news, it's fungicidal, broad spectrum activities versus yeast and molds, but you know, we call it amphotericin for a reason. Infusion reactions, dose loading nephrotoxicity, potassium and magnesium wasting. It has been investigated at low doses for prophylaxis. So Wolf and colleagues published this back in 2000, a randomized trial of 355 stem cell transplant patients, most of them autologous, but there were 24% were allogeneic stem cell transplant patients. They gave 0 0.2 milligrams per kilogram per day of amphotericin B or fluconazole, 400 milligrams a day, and from day minus one until neutrophil recovery. They saw no significant difference in proven or probable fungal infections, but they uh, did see more toxicity with amphotericin. So low-dose IV conventional amphotericin B, probably not our best bet. Um, there was also a study in uh, stem allogeneic stem cell transplant patients of using prophylactic nebulized amphotericin B. 111 patients with GVHD received AMFO-B, 25 milligrams via nebulizer daily, uh, with a median duration of 84 days. Um, there were no withdrawals due to side effects. Um, these patients did receive a beta-2 agonist as pre-medication because you can get you can get a cough or some respiratory complaints sometimes with it. Um, and they compared this to GVHD patients without prophylaxis in the previous five years, and they saw 2.5% incidence with prophylaxis and 6.6% without. And they saw breakthrough aspergillosis in one of the 111 patients who received nebulized uh, amphotericin B. Clearly, that is logistically complicated. <coughs> now we have the lipid formulation of amphotericin B, which, um, which would include um, ambisome or liposomal amphotericin B, Abelset, amphotericin B lipid complex, or amphotec, which is amphotericin B uh, colloidal dispersion or cholesterol sulfate. And these were created to be less toxic particularly to the kidneys. And there's actually a little bit of information about using low-dose IV liposomal amphotericin B. This is 132 hemoc patients with greater than or equal to 10 days of neutropenia, randomized to get a very low dose of ambisome, 50 milligrams every other day, or no systemic antifungal. And there were fewer proven or probable invasive fungal infections with the liposomal amphotericin B. 6.7% versus 35% in the first neutropenic episode, or 4.6% versus 20.2% in all neutropenic episodes, and they reduced uh, 
the incidence of invasive aspergillosis, but likely this dose was inadequate in order to reduce the incidence of candidiasis. But it was well tolerated at this very low dose. Okay. And this is just, again, showing that they had a more significant impact on the frequency of aspergillosis than on candidiasis. Okay, lip, li systemic liposomal amphotericin B <coughs> um, has been studied at least from a tolerability standpoint and a PK standpoint. Um, so they, at, at 10 milligrams per kilogram once a week, it was well tolerated in a admittedly small number of patients, 21 acute leukemics. <coughs> Although um, six out of the eight stem cell transplant recipients discontinued due to a total of eight adverse reactions mostly nephrotoxicity. So stem cell transplant, allogeneic stem cell transplant patients are on nephrotoxic agents such as cyclosporin or tacrolimus and adding even a weekly am uh, amphotericin to these patients didn't work as well. <coughs> but it was, was well tolerated in the small number of acute leukemics. Uh, also we have a study that looked at giving 15 mg per kg IV times 1 uh, repeated times 1 after 15 days of neutropenia in AML patients test post induction chemotherapy. Um, we did have some hypokalemia, but no clinically significant nephrotoxicity. Um, we saw about 11% of infusion reactions. Only one of them led to discontinuation. And and we had a, uh, I apologize, here we had four out of 48 patients um, had a, exhibited a breakthrough invasive fungal infection. Okay. Uh, another option um, is liposomal amphotericin B in nebulized formulation, and this and uh, this was published um, in CID in 2008. 271 hemoc patients with greater than or equal to 10 days of neutropenia, total of 407 episodes of neutropenia. Some of these patients received multiple courses of chemotherapy. They were randomized to liposomal amphotericin B, 12.5 milligrams. Um, versus placebo administered via nebulizer twice per week. And they showed a reduction in the incidence of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, 2.2% um, versus 13.4% with a uh, odds ratio of 0 0.14. There were no serious side effects, although there was a higher incidence of cough in the, uh, the inhaled ambisome group than placebo. Okay, so I'll just wrap, wrap this talk, talk up by showing you the uh, National Comprehensive Cancer Center Network's current antifungal guidelines. Uh, I highly recommend the NCCN guidelines uh, as a, you know, it's, it's an excellent source of really, of uh, in terms of prevention and treatment of cancer-related infections, which patients to prophylax, which patients not to prophylax, usually agrees with the IDSA guidelines, but it's a little more specific. Um, kind of breaking this down. So our, our patients with acute lymphocytic leukemia, um, we usually are going to use fluconazole prophylaxis in them because their duration of neutropenia is not as long. But our MDS AML patients, status post induction chemotherapy with a prolonged neutropenia, they should get a, they should predominantly get an anti-mold active agent. Uh, Tologous stem cell transplant patients either sh can get fluconazole or mycofungin or potentially um, no prophylaxis if, if they lack uh, prof if they don't actually have active mucositis um, because they have a relatively short duration of neutropenia, whereas our allogeneic stem cell transplant patients during the period of neutropenia sh should get an antifungal agent, but fluconazole is fine. Um, but our allogeneic stem cell transplant patients who develop GVHD, um, these patients are at heightened risk for uh, mold infections, especially once they're treated with high-dose corticosteroids or similarly immunocompromising agents, and they should get an anti-mold active agent. Okay, well, I appreciate everyone's attention, and uh, you guys have any questions for me about any of this?